Uh, look, this was triggered when we saw you speak at the ICON conference in London uh, in the summer 22. You know, what's an ICON and uh, why were you why were you the guest lecturer? What, what's your background? How did you get to be there? Yeah, so so I, I, ICAN really stands for Integrative Health um, and um, Applied Nutrition. And it, it's one of the, I suppose, the um, major um, integrative healthcare conferences um, through, throughout the UK. So it, it's one of the big ones. I was, I was lucky enough to present there, as you say, at the end of the summer this year. Um, because uh, I have quite a speciality with regards to um, cognitive decline and, and early stage Alzheimer's. And and so um, actually I was the main speaker on the day, which was great. Um, so let me I'll give you a little bit of brief of my background. I'm actually an exercise scientist by um, early academics. I've got a couple of degrees in exercise science, uh, which is really interesting because as we move into – trying to deal with chronic disease and, and mm -hmm. in particular when we're trying to deal with something like um, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, um, the amount of research coming out with regards to the impact that exercise has on all of those conditions is substantial. So it's great that something that I was originally interested, I was always interested in the sort of medical aspects of exercise intervention to, to um, many chronic diseases. And, um, uh, everything changed for me, Terry. Around about ninety-seven, I I had a very small lifestyle medicine practice in the central London, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I was lucky enough to go and see a, a US guy called um, Jeffrey Bland. He came to London. He was doing a one, once a year lecture, and um, it really changed my direction with regards to maybe there's different ways that we could look at what is happening in the science. And he, he did a beautifully eloquent day on the heart on fire. And it was really yeah. about how we understand cardiovascular disease, maybe not what's been traditionally taught. And he just gave an incredibly beautiful, eloquent lecture of a whole day, just really sh citing some incredible evidence-based medicine. And that was it for me. I, I wanted to know, you know, why was this, why was this man showing us all this evidence and we weren't aware of it. And that was my introduction. That was 96, I think, introduction to the Institute for Functional Medicine, uh, uh, introduction to functional medicine. And, and really that functional medicine journey has been my journey really for the last 25 years. So I suppose um, I'm seen um, in the in the UK in particular, uh, maybe as one of the leading lights, if you like, with regards, certainly one of the more experienced functional medicine practitioners. So uh, obviously I can or are, are aware of me that are aware of our central London practice and um, they gave me the opportunity to, to speak at that conference. So that's why I was there. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Uh, okay. So functional medicine, what does that mean? How, how is that different to other medicine? Well, I think we've got a lot of these terms, haven't we? Um, we've got conventional medicine, we've got alternative medicine, we've got integrated medicine, we've got lifestyle medicine, uh, and you know we've got functional medicine. I think what where functional medicine differs, and and what I would say this based on my experience is um, and my training through the Institute of Functional Medicine. I think functional medicine gives you a much more systems full body approach to how people, um, how you deal with people with chronic disease. It's not an acute medicine. Um, it's not. It's not acute medicine based. Right. It's more a, and I call it, it's almost like an operating system. It's a, it's a system of understanding of how you would look at someone with chronic disease by, I suppose, not just dealing with the symptoms that someone with chronic disease would have, but actually trying to go further back and understanding the underlying mechanisms and the root causes that continue to drive the symptoms and drive the disease. So for me, um, I think um, certainly the way I've been trained for, it, for the Institute of Functional Medicine, it's produced a really good operating system for me to look at someone with chronic disease and not just help them from a symptom control, but actually understand why the symptoms are there in the first place and try and work on those. So, you know, in, in many ways, it's not just a question of putting the plaster over the boil. So uh, okay. it's more about understanding why the boil has got there in the first place. And so that's, I think, if you've been certainly trained the way that, that I was, 
I think you develop an understanding of a of an operating system to allow you to look at someone on a very systemic view. Now, again, as I say, we can talk about semantics with regards to because, um, you know, is this alternative medicine? And again, I think it's a question of how you define what is alternative. But, you know, functional medicine, the way I've been taught, is a completely evidence-based medical approach to helping someone with chronic disease. I think the difference it gives me is that I've been trained to understand how you look at the way functional medicine gives you this operating system to look at someone and say, okay, so here's the chronic disease we've got to do. How do we look at someone's lifestyle how do we understand the patient, which I think is really, really important. For me, it's 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 a um, a revival of, I suppose, w- what I see good medicine is. I think the problem with, certainly if I look at where we are with, you know, the UK and the NHS at the moment, I don't think the problem is the clinicians. I think the problem is it's very difficult to deal with people with complex chronic conditions when you've got no time for them. Yeah. When that when and and it just ends up in that way, just being um, generally a medication for an ill. And um, this is the reason why I think why we're seeing such high rates of these chronic diseases because it's a the very complex, the very complex diseases. And so, whilst some degree of medication may work, it's not going to give you the root causes of why these patients have become sick. And I think functional medicine gives you that really good operating system to, you know, to, uh, for me, bring the best evidence-based practice into how you would treat a patient. And that may absolutely include a lot of conventional medicine. Mm -hmm. So So it's not, it's not either or for me, it's an amalgamation of, what I would look at from a point of view of best practice, it's quite individualized. So, you know, you you might want to be looking at, you know, ha, you know, maybe some people may respond differently because they're different. Everyone is unique to an intervention. And so it's very personalized. It's patient is at the center of the treatment. Um, it's very much based around the lifestyle that patient uses. And then getting them better is about, well, understanding the patient, understanding the context of their lives, maybe drawing out of the, you know, certainly the best of some some kinds of conventional medicine, but also the best of individualized and personalized treatment strategies. So I know that's a bit long winded. No, no. But but your points there are that um, uh, treating symptoms with medication is is a bit whack-a-mole, you know, sort of. uh, uh, approach, but it is time efficient, isn't it? And what you've just described makes a great deal of sense to anybody who's listening, but it's going to involve a lot more practitioners' time than, frankly, is is available. How, how do you square that circle? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think about this a lot. I mean, we're a purely private practice um, in central London, uh, and when you've got people who are sick, Terry, with, with chronic diseases, number one, they've got to be the captain of their own ship. So you've, they've got to take charge of their own health, but they've got to have the right guidance or every step. And and someone who has an understanding will, will, will how have we arrived at the position that we are? Uh, and how are we going to get out of this position? Um, and and again, I, you know, I have, I have some, I, you know, I have family members. I have great friends who are GPs or in the NHS. And I think they're not the problem. I think the problem is how on earth you can understand the complexity of someone's lives in you know less than ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, and and to be fair, you know, I I'm still overwhelmingly in awe of how a GP can do such a great job with such little time. Yeah. But I me think too. you know I I think again when you look at the the evidence and the literature, it's pretty clear that you know we're losing the battle. Um, and, you know, chronic disease has a multidimensional, it's, it's very complex and, you know, you've got to set a strategy up over time. And I, and I think, you know, I think functional medicine gives that to the patient. 
but you know but it's not an easy trip and it's not an easy journey and you know you've got to bring out the what you believe given how that patient um, presents to you and i think this is the difference between evidence based medicine and evidence based practice you know you've got to draw in what you think is the most appropriate treatment strategy for you know for that patient and that usually is an amalgamation of um, classical conventional medicine treatments and you know maybe treatments that would be seen as alternative but i'm going to define that terry because i think you know i think we're talking semantics on definitions everything that we do has to be evidence-based robustly evidence-based regardless mm-hmm. of the strategy so let me give you an example of just a, of, of i think where semantics are problematic for me in healthcare acupuncture has a huge amount of evidence-based research to show that it works and yet it would be seen as alternative medicine. So again, I, 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 again, I think we're talking semantics there for me because the evidence is there that if you use a certain treatment for a certain well-qualified practitioner, that the evidence is there to work. So I don't see how that is alternative. It's just, it's just a different mobile modality of treatment, but it's all using evidence-based um, practice and evidence-based um, science behind it. So everything that we do, everything that we y- utilize, every step-by-step process that we use with patients has to be evidence-based. Okay. The the difference being that it's it's not adopted mainstream in, in the NHS. Well, of course. And, and again, I think we could get into the arguments about NHS nice guidelines with regards to what are the most appropriate. I would agree with you that, you know, I think we could look at some very easy ones to look at. I mean, the nice guidelines with regards to the amount of vitamin D that should be given on a daily basis. Um, the ni- nice guidelines have their amounts, and most of the literature around that would would probably disagree with the, the small amounts that they're giving. So it's a question of where do you draw the evidence from? So again, yes, yeah, sometimes it's a question of organizations would see, you know, certainly nice guidelines would see anything that aren't specific to their guidelines, even though there is evidence-based medicine to show different, um, that they may be an alternative view. So okay. again, for me, it's a question of, well, certainly everything needs to be evidence-based, um, but, you know, a lot of evidence-based practices could be seen as alternative medicine. Okay. Um, and have you got a word then for, for the for the treatments that aren't evidence-based? You, you've rejected alternative. I mean, that doesn't say enough about it. So treatments that aren't evidence-based, what what category would you put those in? Uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not quite sure. I, I, I mean, for me as a, as a, I mean, our license to practice, you know, we have to show evidence yeah. that there is scientific validity in every single thing that we do. So we can't apply anything that doesn't have decent science to suggest that this is an appropriate intervention that may work yeah. on this patient. So, I mean, again, if there's no evidence there, then then it's not something that we yeah. would we would touch. Okay, well, that's something we understand our end. We've we've put lots of effort into that. Can can we move? Now, towards um, iCuro, um, sure. you spoke very warmly of the product and uh, and your experience of it when you were at the conference in London this summer. Uh, how did you first hear about iCuro and yeah. how did you come to use it? And <laughs> I, you, Do you know what? This is a question that I thought, I'd, well, how did I tell you, I honestly can't remember how I was first introduced to iCuro. Um, but when I was introduced to it, obviously it's been an exercise still as that as an exercise scientist as, as my as my default. I really liked the thought process that maybe reflux was something that actually wasn't what we thought it was. Um, maybe isn't the fact that you know we've got someone who's overproducing stomach acid, and actually the mechanisms that drive it maybe are neuro, neuromuscular in control. So I find that fascinating because, you know, again, if we look at the evidence based on just general wellness and aging as we age, the amount of benefit we can get from staying fit and healthy and keeping our brain talking to our musculoskeletal system and our nervous system is profound. Mm-hmm. And so and so that's sort of where it started to get me interested. I think the second thing that really interested me again is that actually the NHS were actually, have actually looked at this 
medical device and obviously looked at the research and thought, well, this actually is probably maybe a good thing to use. So obviously the NHS um, recommend the iCuro machine. And so like everything, again, you know, my role is to have a look at the product, um, analyze the science. Does it make sense? I think it's really interesting that it's giving us, again, and I'll use the word, an alternative view on reflux. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, evidence-based medicine view um, that just resonated with me. So I started just giving some of our patients, and again, what I'll be clear about here is that we're probably you know a little bit biased with regards to the amount of patients that we've had using the iCuro. It's not a big group, but it's big enough. It's big enough for us to start where, well, you know, so we see a lot of gastrointestinal um, problems with patients. We see a lot of reflux. I mean, and, 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 you know, and again, uh, with aging populations, you're going to see a lot of reflux anyway. But the 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 the, the evidence with the iCuro becoming this sort of neuromuscular training device that is, in a sense, is strength training the mm -hmm. some of the um, um um, muscles and sphincters that can that sort of sh open and shut the the food pipe i found absolutely fascinating because again it turns the the reflux why people have reflux evidence pretty much on its head and so what what was there to lose so mm -hmm. we gave it a go and very quickly we were starting to get really impressive results very quickly you know within a couple of weeks people who've had significant reflux for decades were yeah. starting to say, I I'm starting to feel much better yeah. on this. Mm -hmm. And we've subsequently, we've had a lot of our patients come off their medication and they've, they've not had any problems at all. Yeah. And what I'm also going to say is that I tried it out myself because I've got a little bit of reflux and within three or four weeks, I had no reflux anymore. And what's interesting about I mean, it again is, I sort of feel, sometimes you can feel it coming back when you're not training on the iCuro. And then it's just literally for me, I can get back on yep. it. Top and up. I'm retraining those neuromuscular pathways. So again, like everything, the brain is controlling the way the nerves and the muscles work. So it's almost like you sort of use it or lose it situation. So I've been suitably impressed Good. because um, it's such a clever evidence-based alternative to another treatment strategy that has complications to it. And I think... And they're used about medication, are you? Yeah. Or so, surgery? you know, the use, the use of acid-blocking medication, um, that has a lot of longer potential, longer-term consequences. Yeah. That when we're dealing with patients on long-term strategies... We know that it could be highly problematic from a point of view of increased risk of infection, dysbiosis in the gastrointestinal tract, microbiome changes. There are capacity to absorb and assimilate nutrients to break our break our, our proteins down into a way that our body can metabolize them. It's got all these sort of peripheral um, implications. And so the fact that we're controlling it in a completely different way that has no side effects at all and actually is giving really outstanding results very quickly. I, I think for me, that's why I said on my on my lecture, I said, look, you know, I, I, I've, I've been in practice 25 years and it's rare that you suddenly get a, a new device that suddenly over the spectrum of your patients that you're using it is really giving you outstanding results. So, you know, I had no problem saying, I actually think this is maybe a game changer. I do yeah, think it may be, maybe it is. And yeah. with regards to gastrointestinal reflux, with regards to hiatus hernia, with regards to many aspects of, I think, central nervous system control. So okay. I've been suitably impressed. Well, that's great. And of course, all, this, all of that was long before we ever met. We'd not had any contact at all until that's that true. stage. Yeah. yeah. It was it was first when you were at the conference and uh, lecturing there that uh, we heard you. Yeah, what you said was you, you thought that this could be a groundbreaker. Um, I think it could be a game changer. Yeah. And I think that is because... Um, well, I, I, mean, I mean, even for the NHS, the cost implications of having someone on years and years of medication 
Uh, and, you know, I, again, a small bias patient group on us. But again, when you look at the literature, you know, acid blocking medication doesn't always do the job. No. Um, and of course, there are always complications to giving someone a medication, particularly um, long term. So it seems like a, a, a evidence based intervention, which is great. Uh, there doesn't, there's no side effects, which is great. And I think when we're talking about bringing this to, to a, a greater population like the NHS, I mean, substantial financial um, returns fr from this, from a point of view of savings. I mean, it's it's a no brainer for me, Terry. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and as I said, yeah, I'm biased. I'm an exercise scientist, and you know, but I'm biased from a, from a point of view of the just really just its simplicity. And it's so yeah. simple to use, and um, you know, you it, it's so easy to use as well. Yeah. I think that's why for me, it's a no-brainer. And you know, I'd had enough experience with enough patients by the time I spoke at that conference to go. I actually think that this might be a groundbreaking device for regards to reflux, dysphagia. Um, and we can go on. We can go on from a point well, of view. We're just, I, I don't want to do that, but just, be, just before we go on, um, it, it's a self-administered device, isn't it? So the last you see of it is when you say to your patient, look, this is what you need to do, go away and do it. But how confident were you or are you that they actually do what's required of them? So that's a good question. I think in anything like this, Patients who want to get better have to be motivated to get better. So if you're not going to use it that often, then your chances of getting the results that you want are reduced. Um, so, you know, that comes down to the patient. You know, here's a medical device. You need to use this three times a day. But every time you use it, it's only really for 30 seconds. So it's 90 seconds a day. And, you know, we've had patients within two weeks where they're already, wow, this is this is yeah. this is really working. Um, me so, too. I know hundreds. So yeah. it's 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 easy. And when but, you've had someone who's had who's had reflux for 20 years just on um, acid suppressing medication, it's it's an easy buy in. But, but still, there are some people that you, you wouldn't prescribe it for or recommend it for because you, you, you feel they don't have the motivation to do it, yeah? Uh, well, I, I, it's, I think like on everything, Terry, the, the patient's in charge. So, yeah. you know, anyone with reflux who wants an alternative, this is the alternative. But it's like anything, you know, you'll never get a bigger intervention for long-term health than, than being physically active. So the answers are there. They don't cost anything, but you've got to do them. You've got to do them, yeah. So it's the same strategy with regards to the iCuro. You know, this is incredibly cheap. Yeah. Um, you know. Let, let's go back to that list of things. And the obvious ones or where the product came from was treating dysphagia sure. and then reflux, which, sure. which, are, which are closely related and, and stroke legacy problems like facial weakness. What else do you see it having an effect on? Well, that's a good that's a good one. I can tell you where I believe this is going to also have influence on. I think we're going to see this with regards to helping snoring. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to see this with um, some degree of sleep apnea. Uh, I believe you guys are running a trial at the moment. Are you on this? Uh, there's a pilot that's that's published, um, and there's a big trial underway it's not ours yeah uh, we're not we're not funding it we're not running it we're we've got nobody in it but um yeah they're up to 400 patients not right. all of whom are on IQ, but okay. yeah that's that's a big one it's it's finished recruiting we're still yeah so there. so so i think it's got i think it's got huge implications um i also think you know you, you know if i read your research right that the icuro, the action, this neuromuscular action, is stimulating the vagus nerve. Correct. And and I think why is that important? Well, I think a lot of problems that are associated with gastrointestinal dysfunction is that you've got a nervous system that is dysfunctional. Um, and and in very simple terms, you know, most of most most of the Western world spend too much time in fight or flight and not in not in rest and digest. And so, you know, vagal control and vagal tone allows your body to, to maybe come more into a relaxed state. 
And of course, when you are more in a relaxed state, you've got more opportunity for your, it just very simply for your gastrointestinal tract to work better. But the whole of your body doesn't have to be in such a sort of state of stress. Uh, and, and again, I, I think probably where is this going to go in the future? If it is working to help vagal control, then it's going to help with stuff like heart rate variability. Mm. Um, and again, I, I, I've discussed this many times. Heart rate variability is an incredibly well-validated scientific um, term where you're looking at how, fle- how, how flexible and how healthy is your heart because your heart should beat your heartbeat from beat to beat should the more variability in that heart from beat to beat, the healthier that heart is. And that is under a lot of vagal control. So I think it's got lots and lots of peripheral applications. Um, What I think it's beautiful for, it feels like it's a true systems device from a point of view, almost like a functional medicine device from, because it's, it's not just the to deal with one thing. It's probably got a really sort of a pleiotrophic approach from a point mm-hmm. of view. It's also good for this. It's also good for this, and it's also good for this. So I think it's. I think in the future you're probably going to see the trials that are that are being done where actually it's really really helping lots and lots of different aspects. So it's helping snoring, it's helping ob- obstructive sleep apnea, which means that more less and less people who maybe use this will will not have to deal with the 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 side effects of having low oxygen states at night, which of course yeah. increases the risk of stuff like obesity and type two diabetes, in, uh, very much from a point of view of a uh, cognitive decline and, and Alzheimer's risk. So it's got a, it's got a, at the moment, it's got a very specific role um, helping the GI tract from a point of view of reflux. But I think there are going to, I, in my opinion, it makes sense. You're going to see very much um, a, a lot more sort of, peripheral and pleiotrophic applications of it. And and those are different. I see straight away that as working with functional medicine, uh, you can see that um, if it's effective, it will affect more and more and more and more um, uh, issues and symptoms that are related. In conventional medicine, the more things that you mentioned that it helps with, the more cynical people are. Uh, well, you said dysphagia, and now you're talking about sleep apnea. How are they related? Or postural control and uh, reflux. Um, uh, you're looking for a holistic answer to... Um, yeah, but uh, I think what's interesting about that is that more and more, I, I mean, obviously you were there when I spoke. What, I, what my lecture was trying to do was really show that there's some really hard evidence-based medicine and scientific processes now were were the scientific world are starting to go oh okay well this is re- this is maybe related to this and this is the underlying mechanisms and maybe we've got to think about it more from a point of view of a global aspect not just a sort of one pathway for one outcome aspect mm-hmm. and I, I i'm really encouraged by um by scientists in general because i think if we've had any benefits from covid is that COVID, because we've never seen it before, we're going to have to have better systemic thinking about how we deal with it because we can't just do, well, this solves COVID because it doesn't. Hmm. So we're going to have to have bigger systems thinking. And I think, you know, this has not been going on recently. This has been going on for over 50 years is that how do we join this up? And, you know, we could take you right back to the godfather of of the Hippocratic Oak, Hippocrates. This was just how medicine was then. Terry and I think we've sort of bastardized it in a way that brings us down to single molecule treatment for single yeah. pathway yeah. Uh, and you know you could look at that from a point of view of um a, you know a re, um, um acid suppressing medication it does a good job on that but you've got to take into account all the side effects and all the potential issues that may long term come from those side effects so when we deal as you say from a functional medicine perspective when someone comes in with with acid suppressing medication, we're not just thinking about well, how do we get you off off that? We're also thinking, well, we know this drug interacts potentially with 
Um, give me an example, um, B12 deficiencies. We know mm-hmm. we're more likely to see that. And if we've got a patient coming in who's maybe, you know, uh, uh, so showing signs of depression, signs of cognitive decline, that is where we make the links to think, okay, well, they're on an acid suppressing medication. Maybe their B12 levels, at least we need to check. And that's all clear on the science. So, so as I said to you, I think functional medicine gives you that operating system to say, hang on a sec. It's not just about this. We've got to think about the other effects that may be happening because of X. So, yeah, it's the complete system. It's everything that goes into it and everything that comes out of it. And that's that's your message with functional medicine. Pete, it, it's been fascinating. People are interested in what you've been talking about, want to know more and want to get in touch. Um how would they do that? Can can you pop something? I think the up easiest to... way for us to do that, Terry, is that we'll we'll uh, just attach some some links to our website and you know links to all right to uh, I mean a great thing about our website is that we have recorded that that big presentation from from September, so you know we've got that on our website. It's free. It's free for anyone who wants to see it, and you know that website, of course, and you know, the iCura was something that we were using with a patient who we showed was was significantly probably at risk from a point of view of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the whole point about it is is that we're not going to wait with that patient until that patient gets diagnosed with Alzheimer's. What we're going to do is put a preventative strategy in decades before, because this was a patient with significant risk. And of course, as you know, one of those was she had sleep apnea, she was a big snorer, and she had a degree of reflux. So we were using the iCuro to help her out. And that was one part of a very much bigger strategy. And of course, obviously, she'd had... Um, gastric surgery as well, which was complicating the picture. And the iCura has been brilliant for that patient. Great. Again, it's really helped us on that side. So again, all explained on that lecture. So it'd be fantastic if I can leave some links for that. All right, we'll, we'll do that, Pete. Well, thank you very much. We've Pleasure. all learned a lot. We'll Pleasure, meet Terry. again soon. Yep. And uh, have a good evening. And you, thanks very much.